guys and welcome to another A-level biology video, Mr. Phillips and today we're continuing our look through populations and ecosystems and we're going to be looking at uh, succession which is a very commonly asked exam question um, and really important to understand. So the key thing with succession is making sure you actually probably understand it. So the idea is that ecosystems are dynamic, so they're constantly changing. And what succession is, it's a process where the ecosystem basically changes over time or changes over a direction. Um, and when we talk about succession, we talk about different stages of succession, um, and each stage is called a several stage. Um, and effectively what happens is the population changes and biotic factors are, are affected by abiotic factors and interwined and therefore it affects the changes population as time goes on. So if we have a look at this graphic, so it shows you what will happen over time. So we have ground floor, which we like to use grass and your small shrubs on the ground. And basically their numbers increase rapidly at the start. They're the pioneer species, which start the population up and can survive in very low soils. Um, and then their numbers will level off, whereas the other organisms will increase over time. So if we have a look at this, you can see here we've got a different way of saying it. So this is showing you uh, trees and how they go from what we call the bear, the pioneer species, to the things that, that start it. So you start off in a population where you might have bare rock. Okay, so number one is just the amount of percentage of bare rock. And you can see at first that's high, uh, but then that levels off, obviously, right down to almost nothing because the plants start to appear. Then you have things that can survive on very little, sort of mosses and grasses, which we call the pioneer species. And so number two, they start to appear in a successful for a while because they've got no competition but as the soil quality increases then your other species start to appear and again they all have their sort of moment in the sun and then they're out competed by a bigger um, more complex organism and you can see it here it goes up from bare rock to grass to, um, to smaller plant species all contributing and increasing the soil levels making the soil higher quality and then as you keep going through more shade appears to so those original organisms die away because they've got no sunlight and then you get to what we call the climax community which is where there's the most biodiversity that that, that land can inhabit so at first there's very little biodiversity with just like your mosses and your grasses and as obviously the plants get bigger more organisms can survive and use them as habitats and the quality of the soil is getting bigger so you can see on these pictures here the soil quality is increasing so as the soil quality increases it's the abiotic factors are getting more favorable and the early pioneer plants have contributed to that so it shows you abiotic factors interlink so there's two types of succession. There's primary succession, which is um, when life um, evolves on land that's never had life on it before. And then you've got um, secondary succession where something like a fire has happened um, and life has to reappear. So primary succession takes longer because primary succession is from bare ground onwards, whereas secondary succession, let's say you had a woodland and it burnt down, there's lots of soil under the ground, nutrients under the ground, so that will take less time for your pioneer species to set up. So here you've got an example in Glacier Bay in Alaska. So this is where a volcano happened, I believe. And effectively what happened was you had new fresh land. No, sorry, I think the glacier retreated actually. That then caused plants to grow, so the pioneer species. Very little soil, but plants could start to survive. Then over time we saw that the plants, the soil levels increased, it became more grassland because the soil levels got better, better biotic qualities, abiotic qualities due to plants in, using the nutrients and putting new nutrients in. And then you get pioneers, um, you get climax communities of woodland. Your climax communities, which is the most biodiverse you can get, depends on the area you're in. So in the UK, where there's lots of water, mild temperatures, seasons are quite normal and quite calm, uh, the climax community uh, will be large trees because they can develop and the soils can really develop. Somewhere like Alaska Bay, which is in sort of the Arctic area, um, there's a lot more difficult uh, climates. So water isn't as available because a lot of time it's frozen. Temperatures are extremely low and seasons have massive fluctuations. So the soil can't um, survive as well there. So your climax community in the UK might be something like a, a woodland of oak trees and chestnut trees and things like that. In the UK, in, in the Arctic, it's going to be like maybe, maybe shrubs. It might be bushes. It might be... Um, um, like small trees um, but they won't be able to go much further than that because of the extreme conditions. So an example where we could study um, 
a primary succession occurred in Mount St. Helens. So the mountain erupted in 1980, created a, all the lava comes out, settles as new rock as it cools down, um, and basically that allowed us to study succession. So in 1991, after the volcano erupted in 1980, 11 years later, we've seen that there were 11 species of pioneer plants that basically colonized the lava rock, which has got obviously no soil. And then we had um, looking. So then looking over time, sorry, um, it's a little bit of a problem with the computer there, um, we could then see that it evolved and we got more plants by 2000 and then with no more eruptions, eventually it will get to a climax community. And obviously that would probably be woodland because the soil will be rich because of the uh, volcanic lava that's made it. So again, that sort of thing can happen. Um, and again, if it's a disaster, it's secondary community. As you can see here, the plants change as the soil conditions change, and therefore it shows you the link between biotic conditions changing and abiotic conditions. So there's no soil in the first place. There's really poor abiotic conditions, poor soil nitrogen. Then the pioneer plants come along and they actually insert nitrogen into the soil because they have to be able to do nitrogen fixation because it's not in the soil in the first place. And that means that they can then increase the quality of the soil then because the soil's better then you get your spruce stage which is where the bigger plants start to appear so succession as I said basically links these two factors and again each several stage um, affects the next now we could study succession in two different ways we can look at succession using historical time surveys such as the mount st helens example or we can do transects looking at an area where there's natural succession so an area like this could include sand dunes, so going back to what we talked about last um, video about Yinis last, such an area of outstanding natural beauty, special scientific interest um, in Wales. Basically, in the younger areas are near the sea, so the early stages of succession with the primary um, prime pioneer species are more close to the sea. As you go into land, you see natural succession as the soil quality increases um, to develop um, and shows you what you get later on the climate community. And at Yinis Lash, you can go all the way from sand dunes up to mountains with, with trees on it as you go further away from the sea. So a special scientific interest near the sea is where you get very few plants and then the sand is unstable, very few nutrients in it. So you get your pioneer plants that are adapted to survive in the harsh climate, and there's tolerant salt spray as well. So we have something called xeromorphic, uh, xeromorphic conditions because they have a lack of fresh water. And this is things like sea rocket and sea holly. Um, and then as you go away, um, you can see the, the sand dunes get more and more um, uh, sort of stable and therefore you go from your pioneer species to your climax community and the environmental conditions get more friendly as you go away from the um, from the sea so that means more species can develop whereas pioneer species are the ones that start off at the other sea it becomes more and more species because the sand becomes more like soil as you go back from the beach and you can literally see it in the sand and therefore your biodiversity increases away from the sea so what you would see then as you go up the beach the sand dunes um, become what we call gray dunes or so from embryo dunes to gray dunes and the sand becomes much more stable and the plants start introducing nutrients because of their decay over seasons into the soil. And what happens is it becomes much more established and grasses and things like that start to grow. Dunes actually build around them. So you see here, you go from four dunes, which are very few, very few nutrients, to yellow dunes, which is still mobile and very few plants can survive on them, to gray dunes, and then you get dune scrub, and then eventually becomes woodland as you keep going back as the soil gets more. Stable. And here's another picture of it here. So the four dunes are where there's very few things can survive. You things that have to be xeromorphic, they have to survive very poor conditions, very little fresh water, lots of salt, and they're pioneer species that have to put um, nutrients into the sand. Then as they get older or they go back away from the land, your dunes are yellow dunes and they're dominated by very few grasses, often marron grass, which is very tolerant of poor conditions. Um, but because it's the only one that can survive, it has get very little competition but then over time or further back you get grey dunes which are fixed and the nutrients now in the soil are becoming much more stronger um, and as a result um, you've got more nitrogen and things like that and you get a much higher biodiversity as a result and you can see this across any study of sand dunes um, and marron grass is obviously one of the key things here because it's what the sand dunes build around very strong so if you ever put your hands on it you can actually cut your fingers because it's very sharp very strong grass so you can't just rip it out of this sort of sand 
Now, a succession would naturally occur, and if we weren't here, all our populations would just get to climax communities. But because we are here, humans have an impact on succession. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just that we do stop succession happening. So what we get in England, for example, is we mow a lot of our grass, so therefore the, it keeps it a very basic sort of um, grasses and very small species. Um, the smaller species can't survive, because, so the bigger species can't survive because they don't grow big enough to catch in the sunlight and it keeps it at a sort of grass level. And we also use it with sheep herding on the, in the sort of fields um, and that's really important because the sheep herding in the fields basically will keep it eating and therefore we sort of keep it sort of low down. So basically because if we did stop mowing and there were longer intervals, further succession could increase. But with frequent mowing, basically, you'll constantly keep smaller grasses only to survive, which lowers your biodiversity. So I hope that's been useful for you guys. And again, I'll see you soon when we look at conservation.